Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, what drives a suicide bomber to act? We get into the minds of the men and women behind these attacks. There are times when we do a subject that really touches the nerve of you, the viewers, and our online community. This is one of those times. Malika Blau is our digital producer of the stream. You're seeing a lot of comments online. Mm -hmm, right. Can you give us an example? Well, most interesting is that people are sharing their stories of what it's like to live in a place mm -hmm. where suicide attacks are prevalent. So right. we're hearing from all over the world, really. This is from Nigeria. Clem tweets in, they left me always afraid that the person next to me in the bus or the cab might blow us all up in the next seconds. Very scary. And a former member of the stream shared her experience growing up in Pakistan. Hani writes, you live in constant fear of approaching areas of large public gatherings, be it social or religious. So no concerts, no public fairs, etc. Those are their stories. We want to hear from you as well. Your questions and comments, use hashtag AJStream. And also, if you have a story that you think will be perfect for the stream, don't keep it to yourself. Do share it with us. So you can go to Google Plus and make your pitch and your idea may be turned into a future show. Now, here are some of the hashtags that our community is following. What drives a suicide bomber to act? Is it nationalism, religion, maybe desperation? Whatever the cause, it has become a regular fixture in the news. As the smoke cleared, bodies could be seen strewn closest to where the suicide bomber had stood. One attacker blew himself up to blow a hole into the gate of the building. In the same southern city in October, seven people died in a suicide bombing on a bus. The explosions carried out by suicide bombers at the city's railway stations left 34 people dead. This modern day tactic was popularized by Hezbollah in the 1980s and has been successfully used by many groups, including the Tamil Tigers, Al Qaeda, and Boko Haram. In the last three decades, there have been reportedly around about 3,500 suicide attacks around the world, resulting in more than 38,000 deaths. So, who are these men and women? We're joined by guests who spent years studying suicide bombers and their families. Nazrat Hassan is a researcher of suicide attacks in the Islamic world. This is a very first TV appearance, but due to the sensitive nature of her work, we will not be showing her face. Robert Pape is director of the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism. And Abada Araj is a professor of political sociology at Biazat University. So it's great to have you all here in the stream, everybody. Robert, let me start off with you. I'm just going to look here at your website here at the University of Chicago, where you have a suicide attack database. I don't know how you even managed to break it down, but if I go and look online, you've broken down suicide attacks into year, location, group, campaign, target type, weapon, gender. Do you uh, that's right in there. Yeah. They're also highly verified. So if you go to the database, you can call up an individual attack and not just see uh, the details right. of what happened in the attack, but also the sources and not just as footnotes, but the actual underlying text. So this is a highly corroborated database. And a lot of material from 1982 until pretty much right now. What right. is that material? What is that data actually telling you about who a suicide bomber is? Can you say it tells us it's this kind of person? It tells us an enormous amount. First right. of all, not over 95% of all the suicide attacks that have occurred uh, since the early 1980s have been in response to an occupation. That is an occupation where the bomber is um, um, worried about a local community that's being occupied by some other group. That occupier could be a foreign country that's coming from a long way away, or it could also be an occupation by an internal different group. Um, those occupations are military occupations where the local community is under threat from this occupier and the bomber sees him or herself as responding and defending that local community. 
Now, there are specific reasons for each of the bombers that go beyond that that lead them to carry out their act, so the Robert, micro motives. That's yep. telling us about the circumstances, I understand that, but it's not telling us about the personalities. Are uh, there characteristics yes. there that you go, okay, I, I can draw, yep. I, I, I know that that person is possibly a suicide bomber because I've got well, all this so, data so, here. Yep. So it gives us, so for instance, we're able to look at 500 of the suicide attackers in detail and look at their socioeconomic circumstances. And very few are depressed, lonely individuals who are the dregs of society, uh, the marginal personalities we often hear sometimes portrayed in the news. Um, the average uh, suicide bomber is um, actually somewhat better educated than the local surrounding community, somewhat um, uh, has somewhat better income than the than the local surrounding community um, is actually less likely to be unemployed than the local surrounding community that they come from. Um, they are um, typically for uh, men an average age of about 22, for women an average age of about 24. Um, these are people who, um, if it hadn't been for the occupation, would very right. likely go on to lead a very productive life. Well, Nasrar, we heard those stats. Uh, our community is interested in some of the stories behind those stats. So we got this question in from Aisha. She says, is there a common cultural background and are they really religious? Are, are those two indicators um, that you'd be able to elaborate on? Uh, first, I would like to add to something that Dr. Paper said, and that is one very major factor among all groups which sponsor suicide bombings as well as those who carry these out is there is a cause that resonates now whether that cause is a religious cause whether it's ideological whether it's nationalist whether it's sectarian it has to be a cause that resonates a second uh, characteristic you will find is that as there is a very charismatic figure in the immediate environment of the suicide bomber. Nasha, give us an example because you spent time with families, you've gone into the field. Tell us about a charismatic figure that you've come across. Um, for example, <clears throat> many of the trainers of suicide bombers, trainers belonging to Ezzeddin Qassam, the militant wing of Hamas, or the militant wing of um, Islamic Jihad, or then the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, Many of the uh, suicide bomber trainers I have uh, talked to and planners of uh, <coughs> suicide operations around the world, in the Islamic world, most of them are very charismatic figures. However, interestingly, very few of them indulge in rhetoric. When I ask them, so, uh, there was a suicide operation that your group sponsored last week or last month or six months ago, depending on when I'm talking to them, what was in response to? And sometimes they will give me a response saying, this and this happened, this was our response. One response uh, that actually did give me the shivers was, one of them said, no, no, nothing really happened to trigger our suicide bombing. It was just to show we can. And how was and that delivered, Nazra? See, the, the thing I think why our community is so engrossed by this conversation, the idea of killing yourself for a cause and killing many other people at the same time, it's really hard for us to actually understand that. So how was that said? Was it said matter-of-factly with drama? Uh, I'm trying to understand and also yeah. use you as a, as a way into that understanding. Well, the, the, the reasons uh, are given and couched in much more military terms. But how was it delivered? Was, was, it, was it epic, um, Nasra? I mean, you, you're sitting there with them as they're saying that. Yes. You <clears> said <throat> shivers went up your spine. How was it delivered? No, when he said, no, especially when he said that particular suicide bombing hmm. was just to show we can. Because it happened at a time of curfews having been imposed by the, by the Israelis on almost every checkpoint in or out. So that so, one they carried out simply to show uh -huh. we can. Robert, what did you want to add? Yes, um, so I think people keep asking what's the one characteristic of the individual? And I think, um, in fact, what I observe are several characteristics. 
um, some of the suicide bombers are interested in the prestige or the reputation that comes from defending their local community, which is why they often make martyr videos, and in their martyr videos, that comes through quite clearly. Others are interested in revenge for certain acts of the occupier against them, their family, or people they respect in their local community. Um, others are religious and want to defend um, a community, a religious community under assault from a different religious group. Right. When I was in um, uh, Libya, so in 2010, Saif Gaddafi invited me to come to Tripoli for several visits to interview um, uh, terrorists from the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group he, he was releasing from a prison. These were people who went to Afghanistan in the 1980s to become essentially the Mujahideen and many of them hoped to be uh, martyred for the cause. And so I had opportunity to spend hours and hours um, talking with them and on our website, um, listeners could go to the website and listen to these interviews online. There were about 12 hours of these interviews. And when you listen to them, you hear a variety of motives for what was driving uh, the individuals and and the religious motive for instance was quite striking for one person he told me how much he wanted to go to Afghanistan um, because he wanted all the benefits of martyrdom under Islam mm -hmm. and when I asked why go all the way to Afghanistan because yeah. it was quite an exertion he said well in order to get those benefits I have to defend good Muslims who are under occupation from non-Muslims wow. and they were the closest I could find and he seemed totally um um, not disturbed, had no issues at all. You didn't feel that he was a, a bizarre individual. He, he he was not only yeah. he was not only that when yeah. he didn't end up dying in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, when he was part of the Libyan Islamic group, he was uh, sent to school by the group to become a future justice. If okay. the Libyan Islamic fighting group had ever taken over the country, wow. his job was to become a jurist. Wow, Malika, now, may I just come in at that point? And that is to say, my database is restricted to, very deliberately, to those who have either carried out suicide bombings. So I'm not just uh, uh, talking about uh, the kinds of Mujahideen stroke terrorists that perhaps Dr. Pape has mm. also in his database. Right. Uh, there's one other thing I'd like to add to this, and that is um, almost all of the trainers and Swiss and uh, planners and Mas'uls, those responsible that I have met in many, many countries in the Islamic world, the Arab world and the wider non-Arab Islamic world. The one thing they say to, to me is, we select the suicide bomber. And for us, his motive for volunteering is very important. So if he is doing it for revenge, we will not take him because in terms of in uh, using it, uh, uh, using Islamic terminology, they say it must be done in fi sabilillah, in the cause of Islam, in the cause of Allah. However, yeah, I, I, let me give you yeah, an example. Uh, uh, one more example from I met uh, well okay. four <coughs> suicide bombers whose profiles I made after the, the, the event. They were originally from diehard PFLP Marxist families. After the Oslo Accords. They did not, which they did, they did not agree with, 1993. Uh, uh, they decided to join Hamas because Hamas had rejected the Oslo Accords and Hamas was carrying out suicide operations. So they left PFLP, joined Hamas, so that then they could engage in suicide operations. All right. So Nasha, take a breath for a moment. Everybody take a breath for a moment because our community are also very eager to talk to you as right. well. well they're listening to this conversation in, in which one of the uh, reasonings that was brought up was religion. And so that's something a lot of people are talking about. Jamil on Twitter says the belief is that the most this is the most effective form of attack and martyrdom in itself is and destroying their targets in the attack as part of that. Uh, Saida, though, writes suicide bombing in the name of the same God who forbids the killing of innocent people and yourself is hypocrisy, not martyrdom. So Bedra, joining in on that conversation, is it simply religious reasons or are there also political reasons um, from what you've seen? I, I just uh, want to say something before that uh, we, we need to distinguish between uh, when we talk about suicide uh, terrorism, between three different levels of analysis, the organizational level, which is the meso level, the societal level, the society which uh, the insurgent society and the, the micro level, which is the individual bombers. Mm 
because different motivational logics exist in different uh, interacting levels of, uh, of analysis. Now, in regard to the motivations of the suicide bombers, now I'm going to talk about the macro level, which is the individual bombers. Based on uh, studying uh, Palestinian suicide bombers, I took a representative sample of um, uh, 42 cases of, uh, of bombers. Uh, represents about 25% of Palestinian bombers during the Second Intifada. The main motivation uh, for the majority of the bombers, 67% of them, was a reaction to the uh, crimes and uh, uh, repressive actions by Israel. And that's the first motivation for 67 percent. 24 percent were, were motivated by religious motivations. So, Bada, tell us about that very first interview you did. That, that I'm sure it's the first one that, that always stays in your mind. What was the experience like? How did you even get access? Um, I've collected the names of the suicide bombers from uh, uh, daily newspapers. I had to review like um, some Palestinian newspapers for about um, six years. Uh, so I've collected uh, a list of names and then I've chosen a sample randomly. Uh, the first interview was, uh, um, was difficult because, you know, I'm interviewing people who lost their son uh, in a suicide attack. So I was not sure how they're gonna um, uh, answer my questions, how they're gonna receive me in their home because I've conducted all my interviews in the homes of the suicide attackers. Uh, but actually, uh, what I noticed is that because most of these families, all, all of these families lost their sons and daughters, so they have nothing to lose. So they were very cooperative and very friendly, actually. Okay. All right, Malika. Well, Nasser, a comment came in that I want to direct to you. This is a question <laughs> via Facebook where Jackson asks, uh, he says, rather, extremist leaders who wouldn't blow themselves up often motivate suicide bombers. So you mentioned that you talked to some leaders. Did they ever explain why they weren't offering themselves up uh, to be a suicide attacker? Almost, almost all of the senior level planners of suicide operations and trainers of suicide bombers Almost all of them told me, and I corroborated this with others in their organizations, that they, in fact, were very keen to uh, carry out a suicide operation themselves, what they call a martyrdom operation, but were uh, forbidden to do so by their group on the grounds that they were too valuable. These men, they had certain level of training, they had a certain level of expertise, which our group, they said, we need right now more of you, so we cannot afford <coughs> to lose you. May I say something, I please? Yeah, go ahead. No. Oh. But uh, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, now when we talk about suicide terrorism or suicide bombing, we are talking about a dangerous, risky, bloody war. That means, in, in most of the cases, when we have suicide attacks, organizational leaders will become targets by the target state. So in other words, even if the leaders and the recruiters do not participate directly in suicide attacks, they become targets to the target states, which make their lives at risk, uh, uh, similar to the suicide attacks, I would say, uh, su suicide attackers, I would say. There are a couple of things I want to show yeah. our audience, which just shows that, um, I guess we'll so see, for example, see this just, all of, yeah, yeah, I, yeah go, go ahead, just, we're fighting for the time, for, you, I, okay. I, 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 but I, I'll give it to you, for, go ahead. For, for example, yes. 22 uh, central leaders of Hamas have been assassinated out of 30 leaders. Right. All Palestinian factions conducted suicide bombing. Uh, their leaders have been assassinated from Fatah to Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Islamic Jihad and Hamas. Uh, and I would also like to add one other point, which is we often talk about the suicide element of the suicide bomber and forget that the purpose is not to kill themselves, but to kill others. And the bombers need help with explosives. The organization matters to the suicide bombers because most suicide bombers are walk-in volunteers. They're not long-time terrorists. They don't have mm -hmm. experience in building explosives. And for them, reaching to, out to the organization, um, the organization provides the technology and the ability to kill 
others. Killing yourself is easy. Killing 10 or more other people while killing yourself, that is what the organization makes possible. And so that's why you often hear that the, um, the more technically competent individuals in the organization are valuable to future suicide attacks. See, Robert, you mentioned... that expertise is not easy to get. See, Robert, you mentioned mm -hmm. organization, and, and I, I do think this is important to touch upon. It's not just an organization about... Um, the operation, but also about training and recruitment as well. What do you know about that? Uh, there is about, well, recruitment, yes, there's differences in the different um, conflicts. So we've studied every suicide attack that's occurred since 1982. There are third, over 3,700 suicide attacks in our database, all double verified, um, and we have the details of all those, and they occur in somewhat different circumstances. Um, but the organizations are not always the same. Some are very tight-knit, some are very small, some are actually quite large and then distributed over a geographic area. Mm -hmm. The um, attackers are often uh, walk-in volunteers. Rarely does an organization go door to door knocking on the door say, will you sign up? Now right. there is a little bit of recruiting that occurs, but um, as you're hearing from your other guests, selection is the general uh, rule for, uh, for the organization. And the reason that the organization is there, I just want to emphasize, is because they're providing the bomb making capability. They're providing the technology to kill others that can occur a little without the organization, but with, with, with the organization, now you have a suicide bombing campaign. See, Nadra, you spent so many times visiting families and, and traveling around, yes. uh, doing this research because of your fascination with, with what is actually happening right now. Um, do you think with that information, you would be able to say, I know the kind of person that is likely to be a suicide bomber, I know the signs to look for, having spoken to their families? No, I wouldn't. But uh, if you would just allow me to add uh, to something uh, that uh, Dr. Pape just said, and uh, that is one case, oh, a particular case that, uh, you know, struck me. This guy, young guy, finished uh, school in Balochistan, did very, very well, and was going with his papers to enlist in university so you know you have to have a form in quadruplicate and two photographs and so he got into a bus and was on, on, on put on a suit a blue suit a red necktie lots of oil in his hair very smartly dressed he's going to uh, going by bus uh, about two hours away to enroll at university and by chance next to him is a man the bearded guy, a, a cleric, and they begin talking. And so, where are you going? Well, I'm going to sign up for university. I've just finished um, um, metric, uh, matriculation, and I'd like to become an engineer. And uh, the bus ride, the remainder of the bus ride, lasted maybe for about another hour or so, at the end of which the young man did not go to university, turned right around, and six hours later blew himself up. So, uh, the training, I have come across instances of training which has been very well organized. And that's right. then... That's where we're going to leave... Bus. Yeah, yeah, that's where we're going to leave it. That's a, the, 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 that story kind of sums up why we wanted to have this conversation to see if we could understand it a little bit better. I'm wondering if that's happening with our online community, Malika. Well, they still have a lot of questions that we'll touch on in the post show, but I, I will leave it with this tweet from Yusuf, who, uh, you know, after that story from Nasra, Yusuf writes, I think this is one of the worst things to ever experience, and it's really hard to understand the indoctrination, he says, of those involved. So we have been talking to Robert Pape, Najra Hassan, um, Badr Araj. If you would like to talk to them as well, I know you have questions. It's really easy to do that. You can go online at stream.outofzero.com and you can tweet them your questions at hashtag AJStream. We have more time with them and we'll be talking to them in just a moment. Let me tell you though about our next AJ Stream. They are refugees in their own country. More than 750,000 Pakistanis have been displaced as their government takes on the Taliban in North Waziristan. We'll have more on that story in the next AJ stream. But stay with us. The post show is next at stream.aljazeera.com. We're talking about suicide bombers, who they are and why they do it. See you online. Thanks for watching.
Welcome to the Streams Online Post Show. We're continuing our discussion on suicide bombers and what motivates them. Still with us, Najla Hassan. She is researcher of suicide attacks in the Islamic world. Robert Pape is director of the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism. And Bada Araj is a professor of political sociology at Beerzat University. Now, you all do this a lot. You spend a lot of time in this field. And I'm wondering if it's hardened you to what it's really like, and it's so extreme. You're very dispassionate as you're talking, and I wondered if we could, now that we're in the post-show, just be very raw about the realities of what we're talking about. So, uh, Robert, this was not your line of work yeah. beforehand. This looking into suicide bombing started when and why for you? Uh, it started on the night of 9-11. So for 15 years before 9-11, I focused on air power. Um, I taught for the U.S. Air Force. I knew a lot about how to estimate casualties in an air attack. So I was brought on some very prominent television shows on the night of 9-11 to give an estimate of the casualties that died, how many people died that day. Mm. And given the background, I was able to estimate between three and 7,000 people died, which was one of the best counts we could get off the cuff at the moment. And then I was on a lot of shows with very prominent uh, politicians and so forth. And so I was one of the few people as a political scientist to also be asked questions about the causes of terrorism and suicide terrorism. And that's when I discovered in preparing for those interviews, there was no database on suicide attacks. So I went about collecting the first global database of all suicide attacks around the world. Um, and then um, I have since been fortunate to have a research team of about a dozen people and we uh, work on updating that database and confirming suicide attacks 24-7 for pretty much the last dozen years. When have you been most shocked out of the work and the data that you've been collecting in the last few years? Um, I think that um, it's really not about um, uh, the shocking, the, 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 the most personally confronted moments I've confronted with have been in um, a, a talks that I've given to local uh, community people that, um, so the families of, the, of those who died on 9-11. I gave a talk about the causes of what really drove the 9-11 hijackers um, to uh, the, the parents and loved ones of many of those who died in the towers on 9-11. And that was a quite emotionally gripping point. Um, many were in tears, uh, very glad to understand finally the motives of the 9-11 hijackers, um, understanding how occupation drove those 19 and seeing that in their martyr videos was very helpful for them. And that was probably um, the most emotional moment of the last dozen years that I've experienced. And it's because um, I was dealing directly with people who had been dealing with grief for many years. Milika. Well, in, in, in what we're seeing online, there's a lot of talk about 9-11 being that starting mark where people notice suicide attacks. But there are some members of our community that want to point us uh, towards another place. Have a listen to this video comment, uh, Robert. Let me know what you to think. To me, some of these suicide bombers are motivated by the situation they find themselves in. Example, prostration, depression, contribute a lot in committing or carrying such act of suicide bombing. And secondly, some of these suicide bombers believe that anybody commits or carries such act of suicide bombing is a matter. So he mentions a martyr, uh, but what I actually want to direct you to is this tweet from someone, and you can tell us whether or mm -hmm. not you agree. Yeah. Sheikh says, I'm waiting for the first panel member to educate the audience that the concept of suicide bombers stemmed from Sri Lanka. Oh, well, I'm glad to talk true. about Sri Lanka because that was one of the big things that my work did in, uh, when I produced that first database is um, from 1980 to 2003, the Tamil Tigers were the leading uh, suicide terrorist organization in the world. Um, the LTTE carried out more suicide attacks than Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Um, we knew before that data, I put that database together that they were a prominent suicide terrorist group, but that database allowed us to really see that a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group um, could be motivated uh, to do suicide attacks just as aggressively as Hamas and for largely the same political reason. They were responding to a occupation of their local community by another group, a military occupation, um, and the suicide attacks were their best way to fight against that. So, Brada, I'm just wondering, as a Palestinian, and you're looking at suicide attacks in the Middle East, mm 
Is it hard to disassociate yourself from what you understand is happening to certain parts of the community? Yeah, Basically, I'm um, saying, <laughs> is it personal? <laughs> Um, since I've conducted um, this research as uh, part of a scientific research, of course, I um, should uh, be impersonal when, uh, when I deal with the, with the data. Yeah. So I tried as much as I can to, uh, to be impersonal and to be objective. Uh, but, but how of is, course, how is um, that possible, yeah. though? I remember a situation when I was talking to child soldiers and they were telling me terrible, terrible things. And it was really hard to stay a journalist when they were telling me these terrible things. How do you do that? Uh, you asked me a question at the beginning about the first interview I've uh, conducted. Yes. Uh, actually, maybe a good question is to ask me about the most difficult interview I've conducted. You already did. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was um, an interview with uh, a mother of a suicide attack from Jenin area. And the mother, of course, was crying all the time. She still had the uh, belongings, personal belongings of, uh, of her uh, son, although I interviewed her like three or four years after the attack. Uh, she still had his pillow, his um, uh, toothbrush, um, everything. And um, she was crying all the time because um, she was, he was from a poor family and um, uh, he was not able um, uh, to take a, a shower <laughs> the day before the attack beca because of the uh, poor conditions and the mother felt kind of guilty when she was talking about um, uh, what, what happened to her son. What's important here is that most mothers or fathers of suicide attackers are, um, they feel so sad, they cry, they feel like any other mo mothers and fathers. So the claim that, uh, at least in the Palestinian context, I've heard in the media that um, Palestinian mothers and uh, fathers encourage their sons and daughters to participate in, in suicide attacks, that, of course, is not the case. Mothers are mothers, fathers are fathers everywhere. And this is uh, actually kind of uh, uh, discrimination um, to think uh, that way. I did ask Nasra uh, this, and, and Nasra yes. said she, she, she didn't know the answer to it, which is, is perfectly reasonable. But having spent so much time studying suicide bombers, studying this field, is there any idea that you have in terms of intervention or spotting it? Because some of our Nigerian community were saying they were terrified to even go to work or be on the bus. They had no idea where in their lives they might be vulnerable. Is there anything that you can share? For um, them so I've been dealing with this them? issue. Well, I've been dealing with this issue for literally a dozen years. So I've given hundreds of talks to the Pentagon and intelligence agencies that are looking for every kind of tell you could possibly do. They've thrown tens of millions of dollars at this problem, maybe even a hundred million dollars uh, at this problem, by all kinds of different people you can imagine, anthropologists, psychologists, yeah. and the bottom line is nothing is there. There is no way that the tiny number of, even in Iraq, where we've had 1,500 suicide attacks, over 1,500 uh, suicide attacks, which means over 1,500 people have killed themselves. Uh, we know they're Arab Sunnis. We know they're Arab Sunnis from Iraq, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. That is, they're coming from 55 million people. There is no statistical program, there is no set of tells that's going to separate mm. 1,500 people from 55 million million. Right, it's just wow. not going to happen. And every time we try to do that, we end up scaring ourselves to death. So what ends up happening is people say, oh, somebody's a suicide bomber because they have this tell or that tell. Well, that applies literally to 20% of the entire local population. Sure. And so then they're terrified even more. And they see a suicide bomber under, their, under every bed and around every corner. And I just think it's a mistake to keep perpetuating this idea that somehow we're going to find the magic tell because it's really scaring people to death. So then what should the, their takeaway from listening to you and Bada and that Nasra? it's That suicide terrorism is mainly a political phenomenon. And okay. what's driving it is mostly political frustration I at see. an occupation of a local community, which brings secular mm -hmm. and religious people. It makes them frustrated. And it's true, there are additional attributes that get put into the mix. But that political frustration is crucial. And without dealing with the political grievance, 
all the other stuff isn't really going to matter. So all right, Robert, take a, take a breath because I'm going to share this end of the show with our other guests. Bada, what is your takeaway then for, for our audience watching this show? Just very briefly. Uh, I just want to mention something very important, uh, which uh, Professor Babe uh, mentioned. Um, I agree with him completely that uh, uh, suicide uh, attacks should be uh, studied in a, con as a, uh, politi in a, in a political context. But the main difference between uh, his approach and the approach um, I used... Uh, with, but Bada, uh, uh, this is, we're uh, watching, people watching this at home, people are watching this in their office. Tell us something as a takeaway, because you two can have a conversation about your different methodology. I'm watching this as a viewer, maybe a viewer who's going to work can who I, may be can concerned. Can I say something? Yeah, just, but that's, just but give that's me, actually yeah. about the main causes of suicide terrorism. Yeah. What our dispute is, is not about a minor, minor yeah. issue. No, but, but tell me, okay. tell me as a viewer. Bada, tell me, what was my takeaway here as a viewer from your conversation? Um, first of all, as, as we mentioned, suicide terrorism should be understood as a political uh, phenomenon, not as a religious. Uh, there is a religious dimension of it or a cultural dimension of it, but it's mainly a political uh, uh, phenomenon. That's, okay. that, that's the most important thing. All right. Thing. So thank you so much. I, I told you this 30 minutes would go very quickly. Najra, Baby, just briefly. Can I say the something? Takeaway. And that is. Yes, go ahead. After years and years of talking and thousands and thousands of hours of interviewing, when you burrow through, and if there is one sentence that almost all of them use, but in different language, using different words, it comes down to, we want justice. We thirst for justice. And this is our way of, uh, uh, this is our cry. Right. All right, I'm going to leave the conversation there. Najra Hassan, Robert Pape, Bada Alaraj, thank you very much for being part of this stream show. Malika? I'll pick up exactly on where Nesra left off. This last tweet from Adjutant says, Uphold justice and then you'll have no one willing to die in an attempt to hurt you or take revenge. That's how to stop suicide attacks. Probably easier said than done. Thank you very much to the community for being part of this program as well. Let me look ahead to our next show. More than 750,000 Pakistanis have been internally displaced by a government military operation against Taliban fighters. We'll be looking at what's being done to help them. But we will be doing that in the next show. See you there.